Good day, I'm Byron Pitts in New York. This January marks the 40th anniversary to the end of the massacre in Cambodia. In this small Southeast Asian nation, nearly 2 million men, women, and children murdered over a three-year span. Today, we look back at what happened and why and where we are now. Joining us for the conversation, three experts. Charles Dunce, journalist, is reported on the refugee resettlement and is currently in Cambodia. Dr. Susan Cook, former director of the Cambodian Genocide Program at Yale, and Jim Laurie, former correspondent at ABC News and NBC News, who's traveled extensively in the region and a reporter from there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Hi. I'm proud of it. Thank you. Charles, I want to start with you. Last year, a record number of refugees, Cambodian refugees, were sent back to Cambodia from the U.S. Certainly, refugees, that's, that's big in the news in the United States. We think mostly about what's going on uh, south of the U.S. border. But, but walk us through why this record number last year. Sure. So in 2017, uh, Cambodia pushed back against these deportations. Um, they were started under the Bush administration in 2002 and continued largely unabated uh, through Obama. And actually, up until the beginning of 2017, when the Cambodian government basically said, we don't want these people anymore. And the Trump administration kind of responded by pressuring them, uh, visa sanctions on government, uh, senior government figures and their families. And as a result, Cambodia kind of conceded and allowed for these deportations to resume. And I would say the record number is just a result of the Trump administration's broad immigration crackdown. Most of these guys are green card holders. And the Trump administration's pursued an aggressive crackdown on green card, green card holders of criminal convictions which is mainly who these deportees are. I'd like to read a quote from your report in the New York uh, Times, where you write, many of those being deported have few or no memories of Cambodia, as they were part of an exodus fleeing Khmer Rouge massacres and were granted refugee status in the United States. Some actually have green cards and have been convicted of a felony while in the United States, though often from many years ago. I would imagine many of these people have had no connection whatsoever with Cambodia, or very little. What, what's the transition been like for them now, having been away for 40 years? Well, the transition is tough. Um, I think this, it comes down to the fact that many of these guys are American in culture. Particularly, I would say that 25% of them are born in Thai refugee camps, and then that came to the States with their families. Uh, was deported in December. Uh, and he's having, he's working to adjust, but I think the issue is he stands out quite clearly as a foreigner in a country that regards him as a citizen now. He has full arm sleeve tattoos for which he stands out, uh, and locals are not super, uh, not really fans of those kind of sleeve length tattoos. He carries himself with kind of an American swagger, speaks in what I would call a pretty American English vernacular. He doesn't read the local language, he speaks it a little bit, but not great. So I would say that there's a pretty steep transition here. Uh, it's a big issue of cultural integration. And I guess for a guy like Sek, who is, uh, he was in prison for 21 years for being convicted of attempted murder when he was 21 as part of a gang uh, in Philadelphia. But for him, the transition is also not only from, not only from the U.S. to Cambodia, but very much so from the 20th century to the 21st century. And the time I spent with him, he was struggling to kind of figure out how to use his iPhone, how to FaceTime with family back home, how to go live on Facebook was kind of a big concern. So the, the, the transition is steep, uh, especially for guys who were not born here. The guys who were born here have a slightly easier time. I'd say their language skills are a little bit better. But even still, most of them moved to the U.S. when they were seven, eight, or nine in that range. Uh, and of course, the transition back here is quite difficult. It's not the country they remember. They remember only the Khmer Rouge. They remember kind of a much less developed country, and also kind of a country that's they're unfamiliar with the current government. Uh, which, which they often run into uh, problems, I would say. Thank you, Charles. Jim, I want to bring into the conversation you now. Give us some context. You reported extensively from the region uh, during the Vietnam War and thereafter. Uh, you were there in 1975 when, when reporters were, were, were flown out that, that day. What was it like then? What, what, what do you recall from those times? Well, Byron and I began covering Cambodia back in 1970 when President Nixon ordered an American incursion into the eastern parts of Cambodia. That really pushed the Vietnam War into Cambodia and, in a way, created the crisis that continues all of these years later, 45-plus years later. So that was, the, that was the beginning point, the American War 
which spread into Cambodia. Then, in 1975, the Americans withdrew all of their support from Cambodia, allowing the Khmer Rouge, supported then by the Vietnamese, to take power. And I was with the American embassy evacuation on the 11th of April of 1975, and we left, left for aircraft carriers off the coast. Within a few days, the Khmer Rouge had taken over and had brought the country into what they called at the time Year Zero, turning back the clock on virtually everything and stripping the cities of all of their peoples. So people were told to leave the country, leave the city, go into the countryside, and it became nearly four years of absolute hell for certainly most Cambodian people. Jim, we're going to take a look now at some of your award-winning work from that time, uh, this series of reports you did called This Shattered Land. Let's take a look at, at, at one of those reports. From 1970 to 1975, there was constant warfare on Cambodian soil. The Americans against the Vietnamese. Cambodians against Cambodians. What emerged from the chaos was a disciplined and determined communist force, the Khmer Rouge, one of the cruelest movements in history. For 44 months, the Khmer Rouge forced Cambodia into their image of an ideal communist society. The country was turned into a vast labor camp. It was year zero, the end of the old and the beginning of the new. It was a peasant revolution and cities were bad. Everyone ordered out. Families were split up. Monasteries closed. Religion abolished. So were schools, books, money, and modern medicine. Doctors, former army officers, the educated, government workers were systematically hunted down and executed. Last year, the Vietnamese overthrew the Khmer Rouge, and what was left retreated to the mountains of northwest Cambodia. Jim, I don't know when the last time was you saw that, but, but in, in hearing it again, what memories does it bring back for you? Well, that film was shot between October, November of 1979 and January of 1980. I had had an earlier trip to Cambodia, which is not in that documentary, back in April of 1970. I was one of the first journalists to get into Cambodia after the Vietnamese had come in in January of that year and kicked the Khmer Rouge out. And the, the images still stick with me today, all these years later, of absolute desperate people. By this time, they were able to move to and fro across the countryside, many of them trying to get back to Phnom Penh, the capital, back to their homes. I, I met people who had owned homes, who had businesses, who had somehow survived living in essentially concentration camps mm -hmm. in the countryside for nearly four years, desperate to get back into Phnom Penh again. And I was the first sort of connection to the outside world that these people had seen in four years. Because you must remember, back in those days, there were no cell phones, there was no internet, there was no, there was no mail, there was no communication mm -hmm. with anybody from inside Cambodia to the outside. Susan, this hellish time in world history, for years, no one was held accountable, but eventually, Tribunal started. Talk to us about those, when they started, why it took so long for them to begin, and, and where that stands now. Well, I think it actually was a stunning case of rail politic in the, in the first years, because after the Vietnamese came in and essentially ended the genocide in January of 1979, um, of course, our, our enemy's enemy is our friend. So mm -hmm. uh, instead of instead of uh, supporting the, the Vietnamese who ended the killing and ended the concentration camps um, and started to set up a, a new government, the U.S. sort of turned, you know, uh, uh, towards the Khmer Rouge in a way. And uh, we actually made it possible for the Khmer Rouge to hold Cambodia's seat in the United Nations until 1982. So those, those early years were, were very much a, a case of a of uh, the shadow of the Vietnamese war sort of dictating our foreign policy towards Cambodia. But uh, eventually, in the, 
in the late 80s and early 90s when when the UN sponsored the um, the first elections in Cambodia in 93 uh, things started to open up and and more voices for accountability and justice uh, were sort of reaching the 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 table and it took from 1997 uh, when Cambodia reached out to the UN and said that they were interested in in having a mechanism uh, for justice, through to 2007 or eight or nine when the when the first indictments were handed down. So it, it was a very long time, but it was a it was a hybrid court, which is unusual and complicated. It was Cambodian national courts um, with UN involvement and international judges. So it was a, a fairly complicated setup for achieving some measure of justice. Susan, I wonder your thoughts now that today America has a military presence in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Syria, where there's talk now about the withdrawal beginning. From Cambodia, the mistakes that our nation made then, what was, it, was it arrogance or ignorance? That's a big question, but I, I do think Cambodia is a, a very important cautionary case when it comes to uh, responding to insurgencies with aerial bombings and and the kind of force that was used against the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, uh, as Jim was saying, in the uh, later part of 1969 and into the early 70s, because it really it really strengthened the Khmer Rouge. It really gave them uh, grist for their propaganda mill. Uh, strengthened them in numbers and gave them credibility that they they wouldn't have had otherwise. So. To the extent that the U.S. has um, had that response in other areas, other insurgencies, uh, we didn't learn the lesson of Cambodia. Jim, thank you, Susan. Jim, would you weigh in there? I mean, you were on the ground there. You talked to the people. You, you tasted the food. You, you, you smelled the air. What lessons didn't we learn then that perhaps we still haven't learned today? Well, first of all, this was a wider war, an extension of the Vietnam War, and Cambodia was very much a refuge from war in the period up until 1969. Uh, it, it was a situation where the Americans felt they had to protect the last remaining American troops that were in South Vietnam. To do so, they went into Cambodia and created a much worse situation, I would, I would argue. And many people don't even think about Cambodia when they think about the history of the, of the, of the Vietnam War. You can go back and you look, I mean, everybody has been date, debating the Vietnam War for decades now. There have been major documentaries made in the last uh, two, two years, and it's still a raw <laughs> subject for many Americans. But the lesson is that you have to understand the societies in which you move into. You have to have an appreciation of what is on the ground. And I'm not sure that Americans had very much of an appreciation of that in the 60s in Vietnam and in the 70s in, in Cambodia. There just wasn't enough information, it seems to me, or at least it wasn't being processed properly. So we have a situation all these years later, when you go into Cambodia today, you still see remnants of the enormous bombing that was the rule of the day throughout the 70s. And, and you still see the, the evidence of war throughout the, the, the region. People don't talk about it very much because much of the population is very young and has no memory of the war. But old timers do, and and they and they still reflect upon it all these years later. Uh, it, it's 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 still a very troubling, obviously a troubling period in our history. The Vietnamese, by the way, were originally greeted as liberators because they were getting rid of the of the Khmer Rouge regime. But later on, their welcome was very quickly worn out, and they were in Cambodia for 10 years. And uh, finally, the Cambodians uh, pretty much had enough of the Vietnamese, and they finally withdrew 10 years after their arrival in January 1979. Jim, thank you. As we close out our conversation, I'd like each of you to weigh in as to, to uh, picking up on Jim's point, where Cambodia is now. Uh, Susan Cook, your closing thoughts about Cambodia then, now, where it's headed? Well, my, my impression when I was living in Cambodia in the early 90s was that uh, people felt forgotten, they felt abandoned, they felt uh, that the 
gravity of what happened there was really not well understood internationally. And I think that now that there has been a tribunal, limited in scope, though, though it was, uh, where people were held accountable and evidence was presented, um, I think there's a different sense of Cambodia being recognized and acknowledged as one of the worst humanitarian disasters of the 20th century. And I think Cambodians feel more part of the international community as a result of that. Uh, Jim, we'll give you the closing thought. You first went to Cambodia as a journalist. I understand you've returned now several times as a tourist. Your sense of this place now, its place in history? Well, my sense on Cambodia is one of the enormous ironies of the country of, uh, over all of these years. It is ruled today by a man who I met when he was the 28-year-old foreign minister, a man named Hun Sen, who essentially is the dictator of Cambodia today, a man who was installed by the Vietnamese, essentially, and then today he's supported largely by the Chinese. Chinese investment, Chinese construction, buildings, as Charles can testify to in Phnom Penh, built by the Chinese, uh, down in the port of Sihanoukville, Chinese. And these are the Chinese, the Chinese government, who had supported the Khmer Rouge. So there's so many ironies in this, in this story. Cambodia today remains painfully poor, particularly in the rural areas, but the cities are being built up again in the way other Asian cities are, and a lot of it through other investment from other countries, like the Chinese, like the Taiwanese, like the Japanese, and others. So there's a lot of irony in the Cambodia that we see today, looking back over these 40, 45 years of history. Jim, thank you for your time today, your reporting then. Our thanks to Dr. Susan Cook, Charles Dunst, and Jim Lowry for your time today, talking about the 40th anniversary from Cambodia. I'm Byron Pitts in New York. Good day.